Welcome to RVing in New England, the nation's only forum that puts you on stage with some of the biggest names in the RV industry. And now your hosts, John DiPietro and Bob Zagami. And there we are. Good evening, everybody. Welcome to our reading in New England. It must be Wednesday. It must be seven o'clock. It is up here in Maine. You know, I love it the way that music ends. It, it goes boink. Boink. Just boink at the end. Boink. Yep. Do, 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 do. Boink, which kind of leads us to our guest, but we won't get into that yet. We want to say hello to Jerry on Cape Cod and say hello to Ryan as well. But Bob, this time last week, we were 850 miles west of here in Elkhart, Indiana, really about, enjoying our friends. About, about 1,150 miles west of here. Uh, well, maybe for you in Maine, but Worcester <laughs> Elkhart is 875 miles. So, oh, okay. Sure. So, okay. If you say so. I what it all boils down to is, you know what? We were in that room. Dinner was late. There was 500 people in there, totally unconcerned about us. Right. But we, they we were, were, we were the they two were, least significant people in the room. Right. You know what? But they were so happy. They were, did you see anybody in that Alliance rally with a frown? No, nobody. nobody. It was, you know, I, I told the story a couple of times this week, but it was like a cult rally, but in a very good way. They have such adoration for the Brady brothers and, the company that they have built, uh, yeah. that you know, you say something bad about them, they'll they'll just jump right on you. They yeah, just especially George you know, Walker. If you say anything negative online about a lot, right. you're going to have to deal with George Walker at some time or other. But the yeah, beauty the they, of the way they communicate with their customers, both in person and online, is is phenomenal. And they've done a great job. They've only and they've only been out there three years, and they've already started on their fifth building. What did they do? They had 60 people the first, 60 units the first year, 120 last year, and yep. then uh, 240 this year. So that's quin, not Four quintu times. quadrupling Four times. in just three years, yep. which is amazing. Yeah. Um, Speaking about companies, why don't we talk about a local company? We should talk about a local oh, company. Right ahead. That local company would be called Seacoast RVs. And it says, please welcome our sponsor. Please welcome our new sponsor. Well, they're our sponsor. They've been a sponsor for a long time. And hopefully they'll continue to be a sponsor. But they're the number one Croft Park model RV dealer in the entire United States. And the beauty of what they sell is that you can get in these units and walk around on them, sit in the chairs, um, sit on the couches, put the TVs on, and... I believe, it's my own personal opinion, that the RV park models are the best value in housing, not just RVing, but in housing today. Because you see that center You're unit. hanging up on my end. Yep. You know, I'm going fine here. That center okay. unit, I mean, you, you can get that for so much less than what a stick-built house on a foundation costs. So go see our friends, Kenny and Amanda. They're at... Um, Route One in Saco, Maine at Seacoast RVs. And right. now... Creating on family Russia. fun on Route One. So now... Family fun on Route One. So, now, speaking of family to, fun, Bob... Let's, huh? Speaking of family fun... Yeah, let's let's talk to a real boink. Let's talk to... Boink. Michael. Blink. Boink. Blink. Michael, welcome, welcome to RVing in New England. I, I was fascinated when I saw the announcement of your book a couple of months ago and we talked and you were gracious enough to say, let's wait until we publish it. And uh, last Saturday, you published names again, it. guys. I don't see your faces or hear you. Okay, oh. we, can hear, we can hear you. Can you hear, can you hear us, Michael? Why don't you, Michael, go out and come back in. Go, can you go out and then come back? No, I don't think you can see us. I don't go think out. you can hear us. Let me uh, refresh here and see if nothing uh, yet. I'm concerned it might be on my end. Michael, can you hear me? No hearing. No nothing. 
Okay. Uh, I'm going to try refreshing again like we did earlier. Yeah. Hold on. Refresh. Okay. Oh, How, how's you. that? I got you, Bob. Okay. Got John? I got you, Bob. Oh, I just see a name. No. Just see a well, name. Can you hear me? Can you hear John? Nope. Refresh again. Okay. One more time. Bear with us, folks. We'll be right back. <laughs> when you have a live show, this is what you deal with. But we are driven to make this happen. And it will happen. We've there never we lost a show in six years. I've got, I've got all three of you. And I've got all three of you. What, uh, um, Tim, Maria, Walter, what are you seeing on your screen no, tonight? Nobody uh, know. I think the problem may be with me up in Maine. Well, here. Let me try refreshing. Hold on. Okay, yeah. he's he's going to refresh. Hello, Maria. Hello, Walter. You Central Mass. Oh, you still? Oh, you're back home. You're not still out in uh, the fairgrounds, are you? Ryan, I had already left uh, Seacoast when I got your answer there back, but I'll uh, I'll get down there tomorrow and I'll hook you up with Kendra and uh, see if we can get you an answer to your question. Three people and can hear you all. Yeah, that's funny. Okay. And same with Jerry. So. Okay, the, our fans are saying they can see everybody, Michael. Okay, so yeah, I have both of you now, so I think we're good to go. And our oh, audience can see you. We are good to go. Wow. And <laughs> the best, Sorry. the best fans in the world. They they stick with us when we screw up the program, or you know, when yeah. I don't have a video that works right. They're they're very forgiving. Well, well, that's good. Well, most, yeah. most of them are very forgiving. Michael, tell us how you Michael. got to got to writing the new book here, and uh, it's called Driven Wait. to Wonder. That was my Remote. question. <laughs> Go ahead. Go yeah, ahead. but I, but it was an, I wanted to ask the intelligent question first. <laughs> See, Mike, well, this is. Yeah, oh, there yeah, there's the book. Okay, so from uh, September. See, we launched in September 2010 to 2018. My wife and while when we left, they were 12 and 13 year old. So I had a, my oldest was a son and my daughter jumped in a well, fifth wheel and hit the road. Um, initially it was, hey, let's do this for a year because it sounds fun for a year, but we didn't know if we'd like it or drive each other crazy or the RV would fall apart or, <laughs> or what. Um, and we got partway through that first year and decided that we really, really liked it. So we, we kind of finished up the year. We went back. We were from West Michigan at the time. We went back home. Spent that winter getting rid of the rest of our stuff, sold the house, and went all in. So and we, we continued on so for sold, another. You sold, you sold everything. You just said, "This is it. We're getting rid of everything. We're going." Yeah, out. after the after the first year, we kind of kept it for a year because you know we we kind of wanted that safety net to go back to in case we hated it. Was this your yeah. first one or your second one, Michael? That's the first rig. So that was a, a rockwood that we bought used, and it was a bunkhouse model. Kind of had the two little coffin bunks, I call them, on the on the back corner. Coffin That's good for yeah. the kids. <laughs> good for the kids. Okay. <laughs> maybe maybe the whole RV industry doesn't use that word. I don't know. That's what they look like to me. Is they were they were tiny. I guess they had windows and they had to just kind of crawl in there. They made it I work. gotta so, ask you, how did you ever convince a 12 and a 13 year old that they should leave the neighborhood, leave their friends, and believe mom and dad that this was gonna be a great <laughs> So my son was an easy sale. He's kind of the extrovert of the family, and he was he was all about it. My daughter was not. So she was the 12-year-old, and she, I, I say that she was with us physically for the first few months, but she was not with us you know, mentally or emotionally. She did not want to be on the trip with us. We, we called her kind of the black hole of anger in the back seat. <laughs> <laughs> um, and it took... What it took was kind of a catastrophe. So we, uh, one of the things we did to make money was do training classes. I was uh, uh, teaching some software, some web development software. So we would schedule training classes around the country. And we had a class scheduled in Atlanta, Georgia. And on the way there, um, we got, we went past this big convoy of power line trucks. Now it's not every day when you're on the road and you pass like 60 cop, you know, power line trucks all driving one direction. What you, month you, of the year? You, you probably want to go the other direction. Yeah, <laughs> it turns out that would have been true. <laughs> so I, I, you know, we stopped at a rest area. I got online, and sure enough, big ice storm coming in. So we have this class schedule. We literally had people flying in from other countries to take the training. So uh, we 
kind of looked at the pace of the storm. We, we sped up and we got to Atlanta before the storm hit. Storm washes over us and it, you know, all the predictions came true. There was like a couple inches of ice across all of Atlanta. And uh, we ended up staying in the hotel room. It was going to be a couple nights stay. We ended up being there for like 10 nights. Food was getting a little scarce even. At the end of all of that, um, my daughter says, I just want to go home. And I went, well, when she said home, it sounded differently. I'm like, do you mean back to the house in Michigan or to the RV? She said, either one. I just don't care. And from that point on, she was engaged in the trip. Uh, she she fell in love with the seashores. She fell in love with the, the desert. Um, but it took that that upsetting and that catastrophe to kind of bring her on board with the rest of us. But from that point on, yeah, she was with us, and she was she was spending her own money to buy identification guides for the seashore stuff and in the desert, and um, just really really benefited from the travels. What what month of the year did you leave back in September? In uh, in uh, <laughs> was it September? It was September. Yeah. Okay, that's what I thought you said. That September is one of the twelve months, right? It was the start of the school year. Yeah, and yeah. she was at the age where she needed, um, you know, well, we friends were, and stuff, right? We were homeschoolers. We were already homeschoolers. Oh, already so, homeschoolers. Yeah, okay. yeah. Oh, so oh, we were kind of. You know, people ask us, "Do you regret any of this?" I think the only regrets we have is that we didn't do it a couple years sooner because. Sure. Wow. We were we were homeschooling. My income was all online. I was doing web development or the training. So it was all kind of location independent. We easily could have done it, you know, three, four years sooner. So, Michael, um, you were really a pioneer because, heck, you were you were off the road before COVID hit. <laughs> yeah. you know? And so many people have, you know, not used COVID as an excuse, but COVID was the reason that they hit the road yeah. with their spouse and young kids. But you, you must look at the people now and say, you got it so easy, man, with all the new technology that didn't exist in 2010. And the classes that you presented, did you do those live in person? Yeah, it was classroom training. So we yeah. would line up 10 or 12 people and bring them in and do classroom training for four days. Yep. Did you ever have Walter Swenson in class? No. <laughs> no, no Walter might have been there. He Walter would, is he, our... He, he would know it if he did. He's, well, yeah. <laughs> Excuse me, sir. Excuse me. That's not right. The coefficient <laughs> of drag is not 1.77. It's 1.6854. Walter, we're I, had, I had some Walters in class for Walter's sure. Walter's our resident engineer. He, well, he, okay. he does, he'll do no. immediate background checks. He'll give us his feedback. He'll, he'll, okay. He's there. <clears throat> he'll have a comment <throat> within 10 seconds. He'll have a comment down <laughs> below. <laughs> I had I had web developers in class, so it's only a half step away from it's just a different kind of engineer. So yeah, yeah. You know. Well, Walter works for um, for Dell Computers, right? Oh, okay. yeah, I think He's, so. He used to be yeah. with EMC. Well, he came through the EMC and uh, who I think he it? worked for Dell? Huh? Um, well, I think it was he Dell. For Dell. But Dell bought EMC, and then before EMC, who the hell was the other EMC? It was EMC, and then there was somebody else that he worked with uh, behind that. Yeah. So, Walter, so let's Walter, tell our audience that um, people and can hear you all. That's fine. Okay. That's good. Audience, if you have a question for our friend Michael, feel free to ask it right there. And um, no, no question is a crazy question. We're always well, look, at this. look at this. This is this yeah. is a side side conversation going. This yeah. is a this is a violation of show rules, but Marie is having a side conversation with Walter. <laughs> right. We, we tell them, you know, we love them. And, this, you know, the side conversations can go later on. But right. we call that the back channel in the tech industry. That's the back, back channel. channel. Yeah, the back okay. channel. So, Michael, like, were, like were you guys the, active RVers already before you hit the before you decided to hit the road? Or was it? Um, well, we, that, we, we had kind of a, a checkered past with RVs. So I grew up camping in an RVs. We had like the classic 76 Winnebago Brave. Oh wow! Um, that yeah, we we hitched a jeep and hung two motorcycles off the front, and we we spent five or six weeks in Colorado when I was fourteen or fifteen, and had you know awesome memories of that. My wife and I actually um, honeymooned in an RV. We borrowed my parents' RV, so this would be thirty years ago, and so we we same thing. I hitched the same jeep up because I bought it from my dad, so we hitched it up and took it on our honeymoon. So, so that's where that term, if this camper's rocking, don't bother not. <laughs> yeah, yeah, two kids, right? Um, 
<laughs> and then later in our marriage with the young, young kids, I bought, I bought what we end up calling the disaster mobile. <laughs> it was a, a used class C and uh, I spent, we spent way more time working on it. We, we started outdoors. We were in Michigan. We started over the winter outdoors and that was a mistake. The, the roof leaked, all that snow melt came into the roof. So we, um, we pulled it home that year. We gutted it. We put a new roof on the outside. We put all new furniture in it, got it all done. And I looked at it and said, it's never going to be worth more than it is right now. So we slapped a for sale sign on it and got rid of it and swore we never owned another RV. And how long was it before you owned another RV? Yeah, it was five or six years, I think, before we started the full-time idea. Hey, yeah. Ryan's, got, Ryan's got a good question. Ryan is one of our premier mobile RV techs here in New England. Okay. And, uh, he's a member of Nervda. <clears throat> is where, I think he means where? Where? Where, where you were you need of a lot of repairs while on the road? And if so, how did you find the experience of getting repairs done? Or I'll add to that, are you a handyman? I'm not. You know, I had okay. to call the service. Yeah, I can do, I can handle a, a certain amount. You know, I was limited by the, the tools that I could have on board with me. So generally most things, if it was screws coming loose or, you know, the drawers that wouldn't stay closed while you're going down the road, I could fix that kind of stuff. Um, I, you know, we had pretty good luck. I know we had like fridges go out. We had a toilet clog issue that we had to have someone come out. But we, we had, we had really good, luck either we were able to find a service center to tow the rig to and get it fixed find, back then how did you find the service center well you know we still had smartphones back then so we, we still had the internet so it, we, yeah. we would just uh, go online and search no and solar was, though right no no solar no solar um how'd you but, energy how'd you manage energy oh we were mostly campground dwellers oh, okay yeah okay, my, so my, my wife would tell you she's a hookup gal there's a so we came up with a phrase. You want to change that terminology? Yeah, I know. Yeah. Wait, wait. Did I? Did I? My wife's that? a hooker. Is that what you said? Yeah. <laughs> My wife's a hookup gal. Okay. Hookups. Please. Hookups. Oh, forgot the S. Okay. So we we came up with a phrase. I said your 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 tolerance for inconvenience defines the level of your adventure. So I'll say it say a second that time. Again slower. Yeah, say that. Say that again. Your tolerance. Well, writing it down. Yeah, your tolerance for inconvenience sets the level of your adventure. So if you can tolerate the inconvenience of no showers and no real bed and, you know, eating food out of a plastic bag, you can go backpacking or you can ride on, you know, ride your bicycles across the country. You can take on that kind of adventure. Well, you my know, wife, I... the, the, the inconvenience level that I could push my wife to was putting the house on wheels, but we still needed beds and a kitchen and cabinets, you know, that's what brought us to the RV was that was the level of inconvenience I could put my family into. One of I the like items that Bob thing. likes best yeah, on I the road think. is is uh, Chef Boyardee products. Right. <laughs> Bob's a big Chef Boyardee guy. Yeah, he's, he's, he's transferring his embarrassment to me. I just I love that saying because right now, Half of them went to people who are first. They will have that higher level of intolerance. But when you get a lot of people into the industry that know nothing about it, there there are some unhappy campers out there. But sure. you know, we, we have the responsibility to make sure that they learn how to do these things. Yeah. Yeah. Are so, you still an RV owner, Michael? I have uh, not an RV, um, technically. I We bought a... Um, so what happens, we got off the road, we got jobs, we ran a newspaper here locally. So I was the editor, my wife was the ad manager. And in the newspaper world, maybe like the radio world, you didn't get much time off. And then what you, you know, you could maybe take a long weekend and then the whole publishing cycle started over. So we needed just a, like a little weekend or something. So we bought a Toyota Sienna minivan and stripped out the seats. And we have been building a little van camper out of that. So hmm. I don't have like a house electrical system or a, or, or a toilet in there yeah but we've got a bed and a kitchen and um and the kids have moved on yeah they're off on their own as adults yep they're gone i did um, i did mention to michael earlier about mark polk's van mm, conversion. 
project. So oh, yeah. Wow. He did. Those of you who are following us, and Mark joins us every once in a while. Right? Mm -hmm. he, might jump, he might jump on tonight, but uh, the, the conversion that he did on, a, I think it was a 74 RAM 4x4. Wait till you, if you haven't watched my video post uh, earlier today, or if you haven't seen the episodes on rolling on uh, our being today, you really got to check that out. I mean, as I said to Don, early, his wife earlier today, it should be illegal for one couple <laughs> to have that much talent. talent and expertise as what these two have, besides being the number one RV ed consumer education RV yeah. company <clears throat> in the country. I mean, it's just, it is crazy. Ryan says, uh, where's the <clears throat> So we're in a little town called Ava, Missouri, and it's about an hour from Springfield one way and an hour to Branson the other. And so it's in the middle of the Ozarks, uh, you know, beautiful, beautiful landscape in a town of about 3,000 people or so. That's just so, spent eight years to 10 years on the road. How did you wind up in Missouri? <laughs> that's, that's the same question everybody in town asks is like, why are you here? Why are you here? Um, <laughs> so what happened was we when when it came we came to realize it was time to get off the road um we had met some people from ava that were living we're we're um, christians were people of faith and we wanted to we wanted to live in a way that was stronger than what we used to live it's just a stronger faith-based arrangement so we we found people here that were that live in community and when i describe it it sounds like a commune but it's not <laughs> Uh, but they, it's a, it's a church family, several families. They've built a church building. They eat together three times a week. They, um, they do shared homeschooling of the kids. Um, and they offered us just free rent, just come and crash here for, you know, whatever time it takes you to get life figured out. Um, cause I pretty much decided I needed to find a new job. So we, we basically had rent free living, uh, and that's where he ended up um, taking over the newspaper in town. So that's why we ended up here. We, we met some people. Is it a weekly or daily? It was a weekly. Week. It is, is a weekly. I'm not there anymore. But Yeah. Sometimes we don't understand how things or why things happen, but they happen for a reason. Yeah. Right? yeah. So you've been a, con a, you've been a, you've been a kind of electronic guy, a, you know, digital content creator, that type of thing. Yeah, so I, I grew up in a house where it was more about ham radio, CBs, electronics, and stereos, but then also dirt bikes, dune buggies, jeeps, and, you know, and trucks. Um, so the yeah, I go, I go way writer. back with computers. Yeah, but you're a writer and yeah. a, not an electronic guy. Yep. So also a writer. I was a, a I, I'm not a sports guy. You know, in our house growing up was not a sports house, but yeah, we definitely had well used library cards. Your oh, content, cool. your content creator. There were mm -hmm. talk about the book a little bit. I mm -hmm. and we were talking before we went on the air, but for those who didn't catch some of my notes today, um, it's broken down into 126 different articles. So it's kind of a compilation of articles and different stories along the way. And I, I love that kind of a book because you can pick it up anywhere, grab a beer, sit down, and, right. and read. Uh, I was curious on some of the ones that uh, some of the examples that were posted, the one that caught my eye was overcoming a fear of drowning in crystal mm. Florida. Yeah. Yep. So one of, one of our family um, just has a fear of water and a fear of drowning. Um, but you know, I, we saw, we saw that's pictures that's of other people. That's, that's, that's that? me. Yeah. I lost you there in some sound. Okay. Yeah, Bob, get those papers off the keyboard. <laughs> yeah. All right. Yeah, but th that's me. I don't I don't swim and I have a fear. Okay. Of um, so the attraction was swimming with manatees in Florida, a little north of where you're at up in Crystal River. Uh -huh. um, and that experience looked, you know, fun and magical enough that we were able to get that person into the water. And it was just a, it was both a safe environment because we had the, the boat captain there and we had all the flotation devices there. Um, and then there was also that draw of the manatees. So we were able to work that person through that fear and, and get them kind of snorkeling and had that manatee experience. Well, how did you pick out the stories? I mean, you condensed, you know, eight years of your life, <laughs> yeah. to 126 conversations. Uh, it was basically, I want to, I started off, so this has been a three year 
process to get to this point with this book. I started writing the first, the first of those articles three years ago and it was, where do I have good pictures um, and where do I have a good story to tell? And I want, and, and at that point I said, I'm going to do this until I have a hundred of them and then I'll, I'll put them in a book. And we got to the point of having a hundred and I still had a few more uh, yet to tell. So we, we made it to 126 before I like, okay, I think this is, this kind of plums the depths of my photo library and the, and the stories I've got to tell. So you wrote the book about the trip long after the trip was over. Yeah, for the most part, there are like we were bloggers while we were traveling. And there are a few chapters in here um, that I pulled from the blog and kind of touched them up and, and, and put them in the book. But for the most part, it's a retrospective uh, memoir. Mm -hmm. mm. Harry says, what was the best part of the eight years on the road? Oh, all of it. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, and a lot of the stories in the book were the best parts, too. You know, I, I think each of us had you know, everyone wants to watch it. What was your favorite place? But it, um, I think, you know, I can think for my daughter, she had an experience where we work camped at a um, park in Mesa, Arizona, and she actually got involved with the, the, the other work campers who were doing like the, they would do all the, the ranger led talks in the park. So what's edible in the Sonoran desert and what comes out at night and that kind of thing. And she just fell in love with the Sonoran Desert and started going on all of those talks every week. And finally, he said, Miranda, what next week when we do this talk, why don't you talk about the barrel cactus? And OK, so next week came along. And when it got to that point in the talk, they pointed at Miranda and she talked about the barrel cactus. Well, they talked by talk. They added on everything in that whole talk on the Miranda's plate. And so a month or six weeks later, she's giving the entire talk on, you know, what's edible in the Sonoran Desert. And yeah, she was the true. one who was kind of the introvert. Right, right. She was an so introvert she, who, didn't, who didn't want to go on the trip. Who didn't she want didn't to go on right? the <clears throat> Yeah. So yeah. She, was, she was 14, an introvert, speaking publicly <laughs> to strangers, you know, about natural sciences. And, you know, when people ask us, like, from a home, homeschooling perspective, what was the value of the trip? I'm like, those kind of experiences right there. Because she self-sourced that. That was not something we lined up for her um she did all on her own in fact she didn't want us to count that towards school wow. she didn't want that to go on her portfolio that was just something that she did what was the reason you... wanting it in the portfolio she just she didn't want it to be official it was just something that she loved to do and and just didn't and she kind of wanted to keep it for herself i think mike why um when you get together with the kids now does the trip come up often um, more with one than the other. It's kind of interesting. I've been kind of watching that. More with who? <clears throat> more with my son than my daughter. Okay. But she, you said she really, she really had some yeah. personality enhancements, yeah, and, right? And the process of writing the book too has brought it up more because like we talked about earlier, I, I hired her to proofread the book a couple of times because she's really good at, at proofreading. Um, so some of the comments I got from her was, you know, I, I cried while I did this. Mm. Okay. Okay. Good. Let's let's uh, take a break. We're talking with Michael Boink, Boink, Boink. And author of Driven to Wonder, uh, a fascinating book. I, and I must admit, in truth, truth be told, I haven't read it yet, but I've seen enough <laughs> of what's on yeah, it. You get a lot Amazon. of the uh, a lot of the content off the Amazon site. Right. right. Now, why don't you put up put up that link. What while I do this while I do this break. Why don't you put up that link so people can order the book if they want? And I will, go, I will go out and grab it while you do the commercial. How's that? There we go. Oh, Michael, you want to do the commercial? <laughs> what do you got? Okay, go ahead, Bob. Give it up. Let's put Michael to work. Go ahead. Go ahead, Michael. Go ahead, Michael. Have a ball. Just read, reading the whole thing? Yeah, well, no, sure. not yet. Just improvise. Improvise. <laughs> you, you've been to dealers before, so you know, improvise a little bit. Make All right, so we've got a new sponsor for the show. We've got Seacoast RVs in Seiko, Maine. Seiko, Seiko, Maine. Um, must be Route One out there. We're a Winnebago dealer. We are the number one Croft Park model RV dealer in the country. And you can see our happy customers, Michelle and Larry, on the very first purchase of an Elevation Park model. So we welcome uh, Seacoast RVs to the show. Look at that! He did a pretty good job with that. 
So <laughs> Route 1 is the road that goes from Maine to Key West. Oh, and, okay. Uh, you know what? I've always said we should do a book or a video series on... <clears throat> on uh, life on route one and um, you know it goes right directly through boston it goes through providence it goes okay. through um you know everywhere on the on the on the east coast um sometimes it's a little inland and sometimes it gets to beach cities yeah but one of the iconic you know it's kind of like the route 66 of the east yeah and, um you know and, from that perspective and every, everybody has seen a picture of one of their friends at the southernmost point yep. in the U.S. I, I, I had that, as you said that, I'm like, I have that picture. So I've stood at the terminus of it. And, and, Everybody's yeah. got it because that, that's the end of Route 1. I did just put up the link for the – you can buy the book at Amazon yep. uh, at that link. And as I said, it was just published on – on Saturday. Let me see if we got any other questions from our fans. Uh, come up with another question for Mike, John, and I'm going to just check yep. through here and see yep. what we got. Mike, any gonna... thoughts? Go ahead. Go ahead, sir. So I was say, too, there's, there's more sample chapters at driventowonder.com. There's more sample chapters there than what's on Amazon. So if they want yep. a little more preview Wonder. before they buy it. Now, I thought it was, and I even wrote it down here, Driven to Wonder. Yep. But there's a play on words there. Tell me about that play on words. There is. Uh, and it's funny because this, this title came to me. I didn't, I had it mostly done. I didn't have a good title for the book and we were on, we were on a trip back to Michigan. So it's a 12 hour drive from here. And I'm like, my only goal for this drive is to come up with a title for this book. So what I love about this title and why I went with it was it's a bit of a Rubik's cube. So driven has two different kind of meanings, right? You can driven, you're, you're driving somewhere. So you're driven. Yeah. Or you can just be, you know, compelled to or, or you know, yeah. desiring yeah. to do something. And wonder has, also has two different meanings. So you can wonder, at, you know, wonder what's going to happen next. You've got that curiosity. But you can also wonder at something marvelous. You can just stand back kind of, you know, in wonder at the Grand Canyon or at, at Yellowstone. So no matter which combination of those two words you kind of think of, it, it all works and it all covers the content. And, you know, what, what drove us um driven um was that wonder like we wondered at the natural beauty that we saw we wondered at the you know the amazing people that we met and uh, that's what kept us going so Michael, what did, talk, we, we did one second john we talked about earlier yeah. in the program about how the book was laid out and i i mentioned the 126 articles but talk about the three different ways that people can access stories within the book yeah, so the stories, they, it's not one narrative of all of our time on the road. So it's 126 individual, I, I call them magazine-like feature stories. Uh, in the book, they're in chronological order. So you can kind of get a sense for here's what happened when we first left, and here's my son leaving off on his own, and then here's us getting off on the road. But uh, in the back of the book, there's another index that's by state and city. So if you're, if you're heading somewhere specific, you can look, oh, I'll see what happened to the boinks there. Uh, and then I've also got a keyword index. So if you want to know all the chapters that talk about biking or um, the keyword index has all of the state national park names that we stayed at. Um, so if you want some you know, specific content on those, you can use that index. Did you get to New England? We did not. Oh, my. <laughs> That's about all the time we have. Today. Yeah. You know, right. we're supposed to ask that yeah. question. It. We'll, uh, we'll close down the show now. <laughs> Bob, uh, Bob, way to do research on yeah. uh, you know, we had, By the way, the we, show we've been to 42 called, states. We went to 42 states total. I, I um, must our, admit, John, I did not ask him that question. That's all right. <laughs> That's right. We, well, great. here's what yeah. we learned, though. We, we learned when we were on the road. We, we never said um, we missed anything. We, we learned early on that you can't think of things being missed. You're leaving them for a future visit. Because mm. otherwise, yeah. there's just far too much that you don't get to do out there. And it would just drive you crazy. You can't see it all. You can't do it all. It doesn't matter how long you're on the road. So we would leave things for a future visit. So we have left New England for a future visit. Well, look at I don't know if that. With that note, though, that that's an interesting. It's a great perspective. So when you woke up in the morning, how did you decide which direction you were going to go? And that was my question. <laughs> well, you I, want to ask it too? I, 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 well, I, here's my question. 
I told you I, I started to be true. I can read your mind, so I want to get that in there. I think it was before RV Trip Wizard, RV Life Trip Wizard came out, which is a is one of the best trip mapping tools out there, if not the mm-hmm. best. Walter Swenson would agree with that. Um, but um, my question was, did you freelance every day or did you have a destination in mind um, a day out, a week out, a month out, a season out? Yeah, kind of all of the above. So, you know, I, I talked about doing training. So periodically, if those if those classes were scheduled, then, yeah, we had to be somewhere at a certain time. So we were kind of on a, on a destination there. We took work camping jobs at different times. So that put us on a schedule to get somewhere. Um, usually, I guess for the most of the trip, we were just kind of freelancing, as you say. So where do we go now? And it was, uh, it was kind of a, a daily decision-making process or, or every, every few days. And it was, it was any number of factors could play into that. You know, is there, is there uh, an attraction, a state national park that we want to go see close by? Are there friends close by? You know, are there other, you know, we, we really purpose to meet other traveling families so that our kids would get to hang out with other kids. So we would often just go in the direction where somebody else was so that we could meet up with them. No um, weather. Those, you know, yeah. You obviously had to, had to adjust for that. But when yeah. you did stay, were you a one night only kind of family or did you stay for a, you know, four days, five days, a week at a time or a month at a time so or what? Our first year we moved every three days on average uh, because it was just a year trip at that point. So we were kind of moving pretty fast. And then at, once we kind of went all in, we slowed down and we would stay. And again, depending on, on where you were at and how you were feeling and what there was to do. Um, there were two summers that we bought seasonal campsites uh, in Michigan. Um, we had our kids were older teens by that point and they wanted summer jobs and, and that kind of thing. So we, you know, we stayed from April to October in uh, a city owned campground in, in Michigan. Interesting. Now, what did other family members say about the exploits of you guys? Did they think you were nuts? Did they say, I envy you? Did they come visit you at all? Did you come back at the holidays? How did you work that? Yeah, I think my in-laws initially weren't happy. We were taking their grandkids away from them. Um, They are now full-time RVers. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> <laughs> and they left and they left you behind right pretty much <laughs> um so that before they became our viewers they they would fly out periodically and we would we would meet up somewhere so they could visit with us again you know my parents uh were, were all about it i think i think they wanted to be um they wanted to do that for a while too other family members you know we didn't get a whole lot of feedback from um it was like it wasn't really a big deal to them so we, we didn't get strong opinions one way or the other in other words nobody nobody knew you were gone yeah maybe that was it like oh, okay we we don't miss him <laughs> what, well uh, you know you hear of so many rvers that hit the road for for two or three years but i don't think i've come across anyone who did eight years hmm. um, you know at a young age because obviously if people start at 65 when they're retired you know, the, uh, for health reasons, they probably can't yeah. get eight years of being on the road just for physical limitations. But um, has the thought ever cropped up with your wife and you to uh, let's do a repeat? Let's do a part two. <laughs> we, it's funny. Uh, so 10 years ago, I was I was wrapping up my first book. I had a remote job and when there was nothing really holding us except a house. I'm like, you know what? History is repeating itself. I'm finishing up a book. I have a, I left the newspaper for a remote job and there's nothing really holding us here, you know, other than our, our church community. Uh, and I, I have at various times at night kind of nosed around an RV trader and eBay, just kind of, you know, what do things go for out there these days? But I don't think we'll do the RV again. I, I'm, I think we're kind of wanting to find a new experience. I don't know what that is, or maybe it would be Europe uh, and pick up an RV over there and, and go around Europe or something. Um, but we're looking at kind of the different caretaker jobs uh, that, you know, house sitting and that kind of thing that you can do. I don't know. We're, we're, we're just in a mode where we, we know we're probably going to do something different. We don't foresee ourselves staying here another 20 years for sure, but we don't know what the next phase is. We're just kind of evaluating options at this point. Well, if, if you would, and if you want to, one of the uh, bullet items on the Amazon 
thing was launching their oldest <clears throat> off on his own in Holland, Michigan. Yeah. How do you think? How do you think the ten years on the road, uh, eight years on the road, impacted your children in terms of where their future lies for them? <laughs> My joke while we're on the road is like we need to have another set of kids that we leave home so we can A/B test, you know, between them. <laughs> but um, I think you know we weren't wealthy enough to to gift our kids like a four year education in college. Like I'm like this is you know this is what I can bequeath to you. I can bequeath to you an experience that not many kids get. You know, I said, you know, make the most of it. So even when, when my son wanted to leave and, you know, went to a job interview, I'm like, you know, you don't have to walk in there all like, you know, I've been to 30 states and I'm, I'm all that. But if the conversation goes that way and you can mention your travels, it's going to be a story people will remember. Oh, absolutely. And, mm -hmm. it, and for sure, it came up. His interviewer was, she was, it, it happened that she was planning a trip down to the Keys. And he's like, oh, well, we were just there. You can go snorkeling over here. You can see the sea turtles over there. And. He kind of laid out a whole itinerary for her. And sure enough, I mean, it really, I think, helped make him memorable in the job interview. What does um, he do now, Mike? He runs the shipping department at a manufacturing company. Okay. Mm -hmm. And actually, in the book, I, I, when I was writing the book, I'm like, okay, guys, I, I need some words from you about how you feel about this experience now as an adult. Uh, because that's one thing. As a traveling family, you don't ever hear. You never hear back from the kids who grew up on the road to hear what they have to say about it. So I do have some of that in the book. He's he's kind of ambivalent about it. He, he appreciates it. I mean, he went on. He left our our house at 18, um, and a few months later, scheduled himself a solo trip to New York City because he wanted to go see a play. And I was like, I would have never, at 18 years old, dared to just step on a plane and then step off that plane in New York City and go do something alone. Like I just so would never. <laughs> so I know that confidence came from our travels because we navigated you know big cities and small cities and everything, but. Um, you know, he has a house with a girlfriend now and he's like, you know, I'm having to learn how to be a neighbor with people that are there like all the time. <laughs> all the time. <laughs> and they won't go away. They don't, they don't change every week. <laughs> and he's like, and that's just weird. If you had a neighbor that you didn't like, you just packed up and drove away. <laughs> right. Yeah, exactly. So there is that side of it too. Yeah. Let, Let me go. What was the, go ahead, John. What was, go ahead. what was the weirdest or the most interesting work camper experience that you can relate to our audience. <laughs> so we had, let's see, we, we did, we did a private park in Washington. We did a County park in Mesa, Arizona. And then we did a couple of woofing gigs. I don't know if you guys are aware of what? the whole woofing, woofing thing. Yeah. It's, um, it's an acronym. It's uh, WWW worldwide opportunities on organic farms. So it's farms that want help and it's people that want to learn how to farm kind of a dating service between those two. You can, uh, you can be a woofer and you can go, basically you work in exchange for room and board on, on farms. So we found a couple of farms to, uh, that were, could accommodate the RV. Uh, one of them was an animal ranch that had, you know, emus and horses and pigs and donkeys. And uh, my daughter was just an animal fanatic. So she got to, take over the care of the animals twice a day, uh, kind of in exchange for our, for our parking there. Michael, can I stop you right there? Give me the URL again. I want to put it out there for the fans. For woofing? Yeah. Uh, let me double check it. I think it's a dot net. That sounds, that sounds like a phenomenal thing for families. And, and yeah, certainly, certainly we need family farms and, and more farming in this country. Yeah, it's it's well I had one I had an extra W in there. It's it's WWOOF dot net. WWOOF dot net. Yeah. And that is that's a worldwide organization. So if really? you're someone who wants to go travel in another country and stay on farms and kind of uh, volunteer on farms as you move around the country, you can do that. That's that's great. If I can, I know you sent you sent me a couple of pictures along the way. If I flash mm -hmm. them up, can you tell us a little uh 30, 45 second, you know, sure. description of why they were important to you. Yeah. So this is uh, this is a state park in New Mexico called the city of rocks. And I just, I loved this picture because of the scale, um, you know, of, of the RV in front of those rocks. If I took the RV out, you would never think those rocks were that big. Um, it's just yeah. a very, it's a very unique park in the country. We haven't run across another one like it. 
Well, I'm glad you told me there was an RV there because I was looking at the rocks. <laughs> so, that was your. Did you did you stay there, Mike, or was that just a parking photo op? Uh, that's not our way. We did spend a couple nights there. They have another. There's several dispersed sites around there, and then they have more of a, a traditional campground loop as well. It's hard to get into. We, I think we did one night there only. Really, this was interesting. Yeah, that's uh, that's uh, Deming, New Mexico, actually just south of City of Rocks. And New Mexico has just got some of the best sunsets. Oh. And yeah, don't walk through there with shorts on. <laughs> <laughs> so this, this was in Mesa, Arizona. This is actually at one of our camp hosting spots. Um, and this was an annual event that this was the last year of it. So this was the seasonal moving of the sheep. I forget where they came from, but they basically, there was a shepherd and a dog one guy and one dog would move all of those sheep like a hundred miles, just all on wait, foot. Wait, those those are sheep. Mm -hmm. I thought it was a rock wall. <laughs> no, no. My so, joke for this was: so I, I thought they, you, I thought you said this was the down the road or a rail bed or where. That's are they the in, that's the entrance road into the into the park. So that that guy's showing up to go camping, and he had no idea this was gonna this was gonna be part of his day. <laughs> And his wife is saying, I thought you said this was cheap camping, right? Yeah, yeah, you have to shed a few cheap, uh, not cheap. Right. You have to do that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So this was our first year on the road. This is down in Texas, uh, where my parents had a have a house. Uh, so this was a shot they took of us with our, our first rig. Now you told me that you had three rigs. What were yep. they? So this was the Rockwood fifth wheel. That was a 30 footer. Um the second one was a 34-foot Wildcat. That one we ordered new because uh, we knew exactly what we wanted and couldn't find it anywhere in a dealer lot because we were we were living in it. We weren't camping in it. So things like outdoor kitchens were extraneous to us. So uh, the Wildcat we ordered. And then the third rig was a 1995 Pleasure Way Class B that we were downsizing into once the kids were out. Because the kids had left the nest, right? Right. At that point, yeah. This is in South Carolina, Hunting Hunting Island, if I remember right. Um, just my daughter just loved the seashore everywhere, so I, I have more pictures of her approaching waves than I care to count. Well, see, so you have to come to New England because this could be <laughs> this could be the stretch of seven miles of sandy beach between oh, Pine okay. Point, between Pine Point Beach in Maine and Old Orchard Beach in Maine, and it looks like that every day. Okay, yeah. except in the winter. Yeah, this is Holland, Michigan. So I'm not here, but I'm not here in the winter. <laughs> this is our hometown. This is Holland, Michigan. Um, I, some, some of the prettiest beaches and, and, you know, the sunsets over Lake Michigan. So the sunsets there are incredible. Um, the lighthouse is big red. It's called very photogenic. And this is a, they have a weekly uh, a regatta. So these are racing sailboats coming back in from the race. Is that Do near Ada or Grand Rapids? Yeah, it's just uh, on the shoreline. So Grand Rapids is about 20 miles inland. Now, do you follow Mike Wendland and uh, Jennifer, Mike and Jennifer Wendland on RV Lifestyle? Yep. Because he's always in the Upper Peninsula. His his sticks oh, and bricks okay. always in Michigan when he goes out. We're good friends with Mike, and we see him at, okay. at all the shows. <laughs> but uh, so Holland is the Tulip Festival, right? Yeah, exactly. Yep. So yeah, I mean, so this sounds, is the that was fantastic. This, this, I haven't been there. Yeah, so this is the state park too. So you can camp not 100 yards from where I took this picture. Wow. This is in uh, Pennsylvania. So this was the, um, <laughs> in the book I write about, you know, learning when and when not to follow your GPS. So the, the, <laughs> camp, the, the campground is to the right of this covered bridge and the GPS route would take you over that bridge. Uh, the trouble is the clearance was only like 11 foot or 10 and a half feet. So the, the campground had story after story of how many um, air conditioner units this bridge had peeled off RVs over the years. I would imagine. It's amazing, yeah. amazing how many people cannot read the signs and then don't even know the height of their RV. Right. Yeah, truly amazing. That sounds like just a fantastic ad adventure. Let me see if we got any other uh, any Mike, other when questions. When you these pictures like this, does it does it bring you right back to that moment? Yeah, it does. And um, it, it's funny, you know, people will complain, you know, everyone's got a camera in their hand. They're like, you know, put the camera down and just be in the moment. Well, for me being more of a photographer, like taking the picture records that moment, like firmly in my brain. And I have memories that I wouldn't otherwise. And 
I think I kind of took like 15,000 pictures on our travels and um, not all of them, but most of them, if you bring them up, I can tell you where it was. And you know, were they were they were they you got 500 and you got five. Uh, oh, Audrey, thank you for joining us tonight. She's either been sitting there sipping her adult beverage. Are you at a <laughs> campground tonight, Audrey? With your game, no, she's not a uh, Wednesday person. She's like a Friday to Sunday. Uh, that's true. Yeah. We're all right. So yeah. let's ask the question another way. Where are you going this weekend, Audrey? And how how has the economy changed your uh, travel and place? She travels with a group of eight to ten families, mm. uh, and you know every week they try to get out. And she's the uh, what do they call it? The wagon master. She oh, she's okay. getting, she schedules <laughs> it, has it's, everything down pat and works that. Yeah. Yeah, it's we were. Not for, it's not for we religious in, purpose. It's it's for drinking <laughs> purposes. No, I get it. <laughs> we were in, we were in a camping club growing up. I, I remember having big campouts with a bunch of other families. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So we're not yeah. going to do it again for now. Um, nobody missed you when you were gone. Uh, <laughs> your kids have left you. Is your wife still with you? Yeah, yeah, she's talking yeah. with me. Okay, she's still with you. Yeah, and um, you know, but. Now it's going to be interesting, the comments that you get, um, if there's a way to reach you in the book. Does the book give a an email yeah, address? Yeah, there's a bio on the very back page. It's got my LinkedIn and Instagram and website. Content. Uh, didn't I tell you? What's, what's your preferred way? If people have questions after the show, what's your preferred way? Email. Getting a hold of you. Yeah, email is preferred. And uh, what is and that? My Bob will put it like on. The Gmail that I've got? Uh, yeah, you can do m mboink at gmail.com. No, that, we just got somebody you, in. Is that the one you prefer? Yeah, it all kind of comes to the same place to me. So, <laughs> okay, let, tell me, uh, before we let you go, because we got about man, we only got seven minutes left. But yeah. tell me about this meeting reality TV show star in <laughs> North Carolina. So, Kinston, it's the town, I don't know. If, People have really heard of Kinston. It was we were coming, we were coming inland from from the Outer Banks, and so Kinston's I don't know half hour forty five minutes from the Outer Banks, and they had a city owned park campground with full hookups on a river for twelve bucks a night, and that's why we went to Kinston. Like that's just crazy. It was a first come. I don't know if it's still this way. It was first come first serve. So we had a, we showed up on a Sunday afternoon and just kind of hung out and waited till some people left. Um, but Kinston had all this stuff going on. There was a brewery there that was having a celebration. So we went down for that. There was an art gallery that as part of that, as part of that brewery's celebration was doing sake testing, tasting, sake taste testing. I'd never had sake. Wife had never had sake. Like, well, let's go have some sake and just see what that's like. So we sit down, other people sit down and we start having a conversation with them. So where are you from? And we, we tell them and they're kind of surprised that we, you know, what are you doing in Kinston while we're on this big RV trip? And Mike, let, me, and let we, me stop you for one second. Bob, you got that email. Uh, you oh. got the last name spelled incorrectly. Yep. Good eye. What did I do? You got, no you got Roy, Roy Link. B-O-Y-I-N-K. in there. I'm sorry. Okay. See, at his age, Mike, we have Wow. Um, so as it turns out, like, well, what do you do? So while well, we're, some were local farmers and one gal said she was a production assistant on a, on a TV show that was filming locally. And it was, it was a public TV show called chef and the farmer. And it was the story of a local gal that had gone to New York city, trained as a chef, and then came back and started a, a farm to table restaurant, um, using local farms uh, for the source. And, so the embarrassing thing was we weren't TV watchers, so we hadn't heard of the show. So we, you know, well, we'll Google that later and kind of see what that was about. But then the, the farmer couple left, but then she came back in and she gave us a, a post-it note and said, we do this big Sunday brunch deal and we'll invite you out and you guys can come out to the farm and um, and kind of meet everybody. And like, well, that's great. We'd love to do that. She left and we lost the post-it note. <laughs> <laughs> we're driving home going you got that no you got no we don't know where it is so we googled her up we found her phone number and contacted her and we went out and basically uh, there were like i don't know 30 people big sunday classic southern sunday brunch fried chicken green margaritas tours of the farm looking at the, the pigs and the sorghum and um, just this really great time and all with people that were on on an active tv show well bob one more 
over on the scroll on the right on the comments. Who we got? You're wrong. Audrey? The wrong edge. No, right under that. <laughs> oh, okay, I will. Well, I'll here's why I say that, Michael, because we get more viewers after the show. Oh, okay. That watch it on recording. delay than sure. now. So, um, whatever. But you know, under that, Bob, the Hawes. If you look up a little bit at 7:52, Bob, they showed up only 52 minutes late. <laughs> and remember, Done. I said to you, Michael, that we have a Don, very I don't, I don't see, But I don't, I don't see the apology, Don. So you, you've left Athens, Texas. You've left the National mm -hmm. RV Training Academy. You've moved all the way across the country. You're back in New Hampshire. You don't tell us that you're back. And then you don't apologize that you're late to the show. <laughs> They're not back in New Hampshire. Read Zagami. They're there as of June 21st. It's only oh, June back, 1st. Back mm -hmm. as of June 21st. And see only, what I have to deal with, Mike? I have to pick up. I see why it takes two of you. Yeah, that's right. That's right. That's why it's exactly right. That's why it takes two of us. So back to Audrey. Back to, as of June 21st. So how far away are you from Old Orchard Beach, Don? Because maybe we can grab a beer or a uh, Jack or Daniels two beers. or lunch. <laughs> or two beers. Preferably a Jack Daniels, but you know. Okay. So there's the apology. You got the apology. <laughs> We're still in yeah. the apology. Yeah. We, oh, okay. Now he's he's got it. He's uh, I'll go up to go up to Audrey where her, where her gang was. She's yeah. She just, her question. she just put a big one in there. Yeah. We had a large group at Pine Lake RV and Sturbridge. That's a new okay. one. That was the old Jellystone. Jellystone, so yep. Needed okay. a lot of repairs, and somebody they did bought a great it. Job there. And this weekend, we're home this weekend with the grandson celebrating the family member having a, a 91 year old birthday. That's fantastic. Yeah. Next but if you read that too quick, it might appear that the grandson is 91 years old. That's <laughs> not. Yeah. And, and Audrey's 220. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Those are so dangling Audrey, give, us, give, us, give us a quick 30, uh, 30 word uh, promo for Pine Lake RV. We don't get too many comments on it, but I, I've heard some good ones. I've heard, heard some bad ones. Were you there? You know, you were there with the group. So, what do you think of Pine Lake RV and Sturbridge? Oh, I think they did a great job. I was there last year. Yeah. Yeah. They, re they really they destroyed the old place. Mm. Yeah. Look at all. Look at look at look at Haas. Going to be in Nashua, New Hampshire. Are you buying? Yes, I am buying. <laughs> That'll relieve all your fears. Gladly buy you a beer or lunch or breakfast. Uh, I can probably make Nashua in an hour from here. Okay. So Walter <laughs> Walter left us for an hour. He said hello and goodbye. But they had sixty eight rigs and about hundred people this uh -huh. past weekend. Big group. Up at the good Sam. Good Sam, Massachusetts. Yeah, the, you know, good, good Sam has kind of gone away, but the local guys in New England here have, have maintained their groups. And Walter okay. and Bob were the state directors for Good Sam in Massachusetts, and they do this fantastic event over Memorial Day. And sixty, you know, sixty-eight rigs and one hundred fifty people. That that's fantastic. You know, yeah. they'll jump out there and get together. So the camaraderie is there, and. Uh, they love what Walter and Donna do for the group. And I, I'll tell you, you know, these are, we talked about volunteers earlier. It's, it's amazing what volunteers do without asking anything in return. And John, John, you didn't get a chance to go out this year? No, no. We had a family event down in Connecticut. And um, that was the big pizza party, right? The pizza party. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. <laughs> love Michael. They really it really fixed it all up, and the staff was phenomenal. Our group couldn't book it fast enough for next year. That's fantastic. Well, guess what, guys? Uh, it is 8 o'clock on the nose. And I told you, Michael, when we started this, we, we hit the button at 7. We tried to hit the button around 8, and we <laughs> have no idea what's going to happen. John has a question, I think. Uh, uh, giveaways. We've got a couple of books to give away. Uh, we, we have two books to give away. So, John, pick out. Uh, we had quite a few comments. Pick out. Give me two numbers that are between zero and thirty, and we're going to give two books away tonight. And I will contact the people to uh, get their address. Nine out. and twenty-one. Okay. Any significance to those numbers? 
other uh, my than Ted Williams. And, and, uh, other than Ted Williams, my one birthday, and when I could legally drink. So Jerry Plant, <laughs> number one, Ryan Hadley, two, Walter, three, Maria, four, Tim, five, Maria, six, uh, Maria, seven, Ryan, oh, Jerry Plant. Jerry Plant, okay. Is number nine. And then 21, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20. And New England RV Dealers is 21. So let's go to Audrey. Well, 22. Uh, Audrey? Let's go to Audrey. Okay, so we'll do Audrey. Okay. Right. I'll, 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 I'll buy my own copy. All right, so Jerry Bland. <laughs> Audrey Foley, Egan, thank you very much, everyone, for joining us tonight. Michael, this was fantastic. Uh, yeah, thanks for having me. Uh, thank you very much for taking the time. Any closing comments, John? No, I'm, I, I've wrote down Kinston, North Carolina, because we're heading that way. There you go. This summer. And um, you know what? You said it's near the Outer Banks? Yeah, I think it's about an hour inland or so. Okay, okay, because we'll be done. We'll, we'll look for something new. Look, Audrey, yes. Uh, yeah, let's, let's one run. Of our we all, we have great guests. All of our all of our. <laughs> yeah. Let's let's great. run a, let's run a minute over, John, and let's unveil what you are going to be doing, June twenty third to July. We have got something special, and we're gonna break we're gonna break it tonight. We haven't even issued the press release yet. I'm gonna break it at the end of the show. At the end of the <laughs> show, nobody's left. But basically, here's what happened. I. I just got so upset when I saw all this negative news about, um, you know, don't go camping this summer because it costs too much and the campgrounds are crowded and there's going to be traffic on the highway. And I said, you know what, folks, the only time we really have is now we don't have next year. Mm -hmm. Next year is a, is a promissory note. Today is cash. And yesterday is, is a canceled check. So um, my wife, Oldest grand, oldest granddaughter and I are hitting the road and uh, we're going from Maine to Florida. And um, you know what? We've got some assistance, uh, promotional sponsorship from Campers Inn, KOA. Um, Bob, help me out. Um, well, the motorhome the motor from Forest River. Trip Wizard. And we've got a beautiful Europa, Dynamax Europa motorhome coming from... Um, Forest River. So we're looking forward to that. We'll be talking every Wednesday night. We'll be doing live updates. And um, you know what? And here's the thing. Here's the crazy, crazy thing. I said, do it now because you don't know what's happening in the future. And since we, we came up with the idea of this trip, I had one friend, 43 years old, and another friend who was retired for two months, both suddenly pass away. Mm. So if there's ever an example of do it now, um, we all know somebody like that. We all mm -hmm. know somebody who came across a catastrophic illness and was gone. So do mm -hmm. it now, folks. We'll have we'll have more information for you as we get closer to that. But it it just kind of grab it. It just exploded once John and I talked about it, and mm -hmm. uh, it's going to be fantastic. And uh, we got great support. So we'll we'll be doing that and following. Well, John will be doing it. <laughs> I'll be I'll be running the command center here in Maine, so we can do that. Michael, any closing words for our fans? Oh, just I appreciate the time to talk about it, and uh, and hopefully um, there'll buy be the something book. in the book that resonates with them. Yeah, buy the book. Yeah, buy <laughs> the book. All right, we're going to hit our closing video. We'll catch up to you and safe travels down the road, and have a great camping summer. And, and we'll see special you thanks later. to special thanks to Seacoast RV. Right, Seacoast RV uh, sponsor. Thank you very much. Right. Michael, great. <clears throat> this edition of RVing in New England was a presentation of the New England RV Dealers Association. Thanks for watching, and be sure to like us on Facebook, YouTube, and Instagram.